against all odds. We don't need people closing this out and say, oh, well, we got our candidates. I think we should have a debate. GOP presidential candidate Ron Paul is putting it all on the line as today's guest host. Gold, the Fed, the global economy, and the race for the White House. We welcome our guest host this morning, Texas Congressman and Republican presidential candidate Ron Paul. Dr. Paul, thank you for joining us this thank morning. Thank you. Very nice to be with you. Can you give us an update on where the campaign stands right now? Yeah, we had a pretty good weekend. Uh, there were some uh, caucuses meeting and delegate selections and then in uh, Minneapolis, uh, in Minnesota, we had uh, we got 20 out of 24 of the delegates, and uh, in in Missouri, uh, there were 20 out of 40 that we got. In Iowa, there was a meeting that was held to select the uh, uh, steering committee. There are 17 members of the steering committee. We got 15 out of the 17, and we have the uh, uh, chairman of the party in Iowa. And this type of activity is going on around the country, so it doesn't get the attention that we think it deserves. But uh, I, I think the campaign's going very well. A lot of people like to write us off and say, why are you there? Why are you doing these things? Well, the market tells me that we're doing pretty well because uh, the crowds get bigger, uh, the money keeps coming in, the enthusiasm grows. Uh, we can get up to 8,000 people on college campuses. Yesterday, in very, very bad weather in Philadelphia, we had almost 4,500 people show up and stood in the rain for two, three hours. So the enthusiasm is there, the money is there. Uh, we're making inroads in the uh, structure of the Republican Party. And the one thing everybody's agreeing on is something has to be done in is, this country. They're the very country? unhappy with the way things are going uh, around the world in this country, monetarily, financially, debt, this whole problem. Is, is that what the campaign is about? Meaning, from a practical perspective, uh, the polls would suggest that the chances of winning are very, very low, if, if not impossible. Is this not about winning so much as about changing the debate? Why, well, why can't it be both? Uh, people want to say, see, people have a trouble on seeing a candidate that really believes in something, and the goal is to move that, and therefore he doesn't want to win, or he doesn't, his goal isn't to win. I mean, it's, this is what I did in the congressional races. I mean, people wrote me off, and I won 12 times. But it was always on, on the beliefs that I had, and the, winning the election was the endorsement. So yes, you want run to win. If you win, you really get the endorsement. If you do well, you get some endorsement. But there is certainly no doubt, I don't shy away from the fact that it has a lot to do with changing the nature of the debate. I mean, this, if you don't change the nature of the debate, you can't tinker with the budget. This is why not Nothing's happening in Washington because there's no philosophic discussion. Both party leaders endorse the same foreign policy. They endorse the same monetary policy. They really don't care about spending and debt. Republicans say, well, we're going to balance the budget in 30 years. I want to cut a trillion dollars and balance it in three years. I want to change the monetary system so that politicians can't get away with spending and getting their debt taken care of by, by the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a big difference. But this is what the young people, the young people know this. They know what's coming on and they're rallying because they're, they're inheriting this mess. Besides, they've been sucked into the system too. They ended up with tens of thousands of dollars of debt, a trillion dollars of student right. debt. So you and they don't get, and they can't get jobs. So they know structurally there's something wrong. So it's a philosophic argument, uh, more so than a political argument. So do you still believe you can get enough delegates to win the Republican nomination? Oh, theoretically you can. Uh, it, it's it's uh, not likely, but we, uh, it, you can't ever tell. You know, nobody knew that Santorum was going to drop out uh, last week, but only about a little over half the votes have been counted. When we come up with Texas and California, another third of the votes are yet to be counted. So you don't know. But in theory, you can. In practical counting, yeah, I, I think we're very realistic. But the one thing that is not practical and not realistic for the supporters who have encouraged me to do this would be to say, well, we're in the third lap of a mile race. We're behind. Oh, okay, let's just walk off and off the, off the field. That's the way they would see that. You don't quit because you happen to be behind. You want to see how you do. And who knows? Maybe somebody will stumble. You can't ever tell. Santorum dropped out. Because in theory, you can win likelihood. Of course, it's obvious. Well, Santorum, Santorum dropped out because he, he did not think he could eventually win. Would you, are you in this to the end? Or are you in this in until there's not a mathematical chance, or where do, where do you see the inconclusion? Will you take this all the way? 
uh, of course, I decided as we go along, uh, you know, if, if, if tomorrow he, uh, Romney had the absolute number, uh, I would probably continue in a modified way to maximize the number of delegates to go to that convention. They have worked so hard. It's not like six months or two years. It's been for four years they have been working. I mean, there's some states we've had 10 and 20 new state representatives and state senators involved. And for us to say, well, we don't want a presence. We're going to give up. Uh, we're going to maximize the delegates. Even a lot of the delegates where the uh, delegates are, uh, are required to vote for Romney, they're our supporters, but they're going to be there, and they'll have an influence. They'll have something to do with the platform. So it's, it's a much bigger thing than anybody realizes. And uh, I, I think I go by now. Ordinarily, in an ordinary campaign, if you get in and say, well, it looks like Romney's going to win, you don't get any money. You end up with debt, and, uh, and, and you don't get any crowds out. I mean, the other candidates, I mean, they're not going to get, uh, get these thousands and thousands of people coming out on the campus. So the market is telling me that this campaign is very, very viable for two reasons. One, they want to win if we can. They want to maximize the, the delegates. And they do want to have an impact. I mean, that is, is very important to every single supporter. Is Romney a flawed candidate, in your opinion? Well, I think the system is so flawed, and I think all the other candidates and all the Democrats are, in, uh, you know, deeply flawed philosophically because they've been taught by the same economists. They've all endorsed a foreign policy, which is deeply flawed, and, and their understanding and need to follow the Constitution is quite different. So I, I think the Congress, the system is deeply flawed and they endorse interventionism, Keynesian economics, paper money. But how about money. Mitt Romney? How about Mitt Romney? I think he's, he... part of the, he's part of that whole crowd uh, of politicians, Republicans and Democrats, that are much closer together than most people realize. Does, does that mean not that, that much difference does... when you come to policy. Rhetoric might be different, but just think, we get the Republicans in and what do you do? You, you get double the size of the Department of Education, uh, you get more medical government medicine. So this is why young people are so disgusted. Well, they heard this said so that he would cut often back and they, they don't get what they're supposed to get. Pardon me? Romney had said, I think just last week, that he would cut back <clears throat> the Department of education, not get rid of it, but to cut back on its size. Yeah, but, you know, the Republicans have hinted to that for uh, 30, 40 years, and they've never done a thing. Mm. I think the difference is they know I'm serious. Why don't you run as an independent candidate if, if the system is that flawed? Well, I, I'm, I've been a Republican. You know, I, was, I won as a Republican for 12 years, and I convinced Republicans and independents. Matter of fact, when I first started running, it wasn't a Republican district, so I had to convince Democrats uh, and independence. By the way, that's, that's where our support is, and that's why we seem to come up short, you know, in a Republican primary, because uh, our, our support is tremendous. You know, when you put my name up against o Obama, I can do better than, than Romney. But you don't hear that. You know, nobody talks about that. But it's been in Rasmussen this last weekend. I, have, I was one point higher, and, and Romney was essentially tied or one point behind. But you haven't won a state in three attempts in running for the presidential nomination. You haven't won a state. Why is that? When you have such a strong support base, why not well, win these states? Because sometimes they're independents and sometimes they're Democrats, and they feel pretty uncomfortable going to a Republican primary. But winning a state right now is getting out of the state and dominating that, uh, that, that caucus. And that's still up for grabs, just like I said. Right. You know, uh, Minneapolis, Maine, we still have a chance, and as, as well as Nevada, uh, Alaska, we had the votes there to dominate, and they just locked the doors. They kept us out, and they're fighting that battle now. They did that four years ago in Nevada, and a year or so later they admitted they did it. And they found the documents that showed that we had the votes to take over the convention, but they didn't want us to. So, yes, we're challenged in the status quo uh, of the entire country as well as the Republican Party. And people don't like to give up their power. But uh, the momentum is very powerful. You know, I'm part of it, but uh, I'm not it. It's much bigger than me, I'll tell you. Dr. Paul is going to be with us throughout the rest of the program. He is our guest host from 7 to 9 a.m. We'll get his thoughts on gold, oil, and the future of the Fed. Much more to come. Uh, recognize we have Ron Paul here on the set. We're in, we're in the middle of these big presidential, this pre big presidential election. Uh, whatever the economic number is or the unemployment number may be by the end of the year may ultimately decide all this. Uh, where do you expect all this to shake out? Look, I think uh, in, in a weak recovery, we're going to have a really hard time getting this unemployment rate uh, down 
uh, below 8%. I mean, it, it may tick there a, you know, a tiny bit, but uh, you add in the underemployment and you, you've still got um, mid-teens in terms of uh, broad-based measures of labor market distress in the United States, uh, which is really without precedent for uh, a so-called peacetime expansion. So the economy uh, does remain, uh, I think, the central issue uh, for the upcoming uh, campaign. And uh, Representative Paul is uh, focused on that uh, uh, very much so uh, for a number of years. Stephen, Representative Paul is also focused on the idea of a gold standard. Would you say that's the right way to go for the U.S. economy? No, and he, he wants to end the Fed. I don't buy that either. But look, he's, he, he just made the point in the previous segment that, you know, the, the political debate should be about ideology and philosophy, and that, that's a fair point. And he's got very extreme views on gold and the Fed <laughs> that I don't agree with. But, I, you know, I, I respect his, uh, his position and his willingness to debate these issues. Okay, Ron. You, you, you have the floor. It's yours if you want it. Well, the thing of it is, if, you, if you're not for a commodity standard, gold, silver, or whatever the market picks, you have to be for a paper standard. <laughs> and the record for paper is a lot worse than the record for commodities. You know, if you have a gold coin from Roman times, it's still worth something. But paper money it, it essentially always destructs. It self-destructs because it encourages politicians to spend too much and print too much. And that's why we have a debt crisis right now. So to argue against gold means you have to argue for paper. And if you're for paper, it's necessary to have paper to finance government that the people don't support. Otherwise, the people would just pay their taxes and fight these wars and, and support the entitlement system. But uh, yes, the people want the programs, but they don't want to pay for them. And you have to have paper to do this. But paper will always end badly. And we're in the process of the end of this, the, uh, the European currency. The only reason the dollar does so well is the European is such a mess over there. And we still have a bit of a reserve status. But, but I would think that uh, uh, defending paper is much more difficult than defending honest uh, money. And, and besides, it's still on the Constitution that we didn't repeal that part that said that legal tender ought to be gold and silver. Steve, Look, I, I, I think you know, you're really overstating uh, and exaggerating paper versus uh, something hard. You know, under, under Paul Volcker, um, you know, late 70s, early 80s, we had paper. We just had a disciplined, tough monetary policy that uh, was aimed at squeezing a hyperinflation out of the system. We need a responsible policy. It's not a question of uh, hard or soft, you know, gold or paper. We just need policy, mm -hmm. discipline, and an independent Fed, not, not a Fed that is eliminated, as you, as you have argued in your book. But the, the uh, purchasing power of the dollar, since the Fed's been in charge, we've lost 97% of it. The purchasing power of gold for thousands and thousands a year maintains its value. And actually, with increase in productivity, it goes up in value. You know, Ron Paul, stop right there. Let's get Stephen Roach's response to that. How Stephen, do you, how do is you that come right up? that we've lost 97% no, of the not, value? No, it's not, not even close. I mean, I, I, I would challenge the congressman's uh, numbers. How have we lost 97% of the purchasing power of the dollar relative to what? I mean, Amer the, the American economy has done darn well. We're having problems right now. There's no question about it. We went through a horrific crisis. And part of that, you're correct in pointing out, reflected uh, 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 irresponsible uh, monetary policy uh, uh, in the years leading up to the subprime crisis. But to, to, to be on television and tell the American public they've lost 97% of the purchasing power of their currency uh, is, I think, really irresponsible. Okay, what about, uh, you know, when the Fed took over, the ratio was $20, uh, uh, $20 to an ounce. Today it's 1650 to an ounce. What percentage is that? That has to be awfully close. And CPI is not quite as much. And you're right, you have to pick what you're comparing it to. But uh, historically, the best measurement of the purchasing power of a currency uh, it is gold. Just look at uh, the disaster in the stock market today in, in valued in gold. It, it is, it, if you ever look at that curve, in the last 10, 12 years, the value of the stock market is down a lot worse than the nominal value, let me tell you. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right about that. But again, to compare the purchasing power of the dollar for an average American uh, to the price of gold, that uh, a, a precious metal that he or she uh, doesn't own, except maybe a few of them have it in their in their mouth. Is is I, I just don't think an accurate 
uh, way to, to judge the, um, yeah. the strength of the economy. Steve, you have to repeal some economic laws that have been around for a good many years. Uh, Steve, we're going to set up a lunch so you guys can uh, continue the debate. Uh, <laughs> Thank appreciate you being here. Uh, <laughs> Yale University, Steve Roach. Well, I happen to agree with a lot of his writing. I enjoy reading. And Ron, I Ron Paul is going to be here for, uh, for the, for Thank the you, remaining Thank uh, you, Congressman. portion of the show. Thanks so much. Let's uh, continue our discussion with our guest, guest host. We were just talking about the gold standard, and uh, Congressman Paul identified me as one of those paper people, which is not <laughs> the worst thing somebody has said about me on TV here. Uh, Congressman, one of the problems with the gold standard uh, that has been pointed out by economists is the inability of the government to respond with lower interest rates in a recession. Um, and, and the idea that the government is hamstrung, in fact, it has to raise interest rates to keep the gold in the country. Is that what you want the government well, doing during a recession, well, is well, to raise interest rates? What I want is a market economy. I don't want the dependency. Matter of fact, that's the big disadvantage of paper because of the moral hazard. If we get into trouble, we always know the lender of last resort. It was set up for that reason. 19, the lender of last resort. Gamble, do anything, take risks, the government's insurance. So they get into that trouble. But if they get in the trouble, they shouldn't come and rescue the economy. They shouldn't be bailing out General Motors and these trillions of dollars with it, both the Fed and the Congress. That was set up. The, the mortgage, and I complained about that for 10 years. You know, this line of credit of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that is the moral hazard. Paper money is a moral hazard, encourages people to make a lot of risky investment, malinvestments, and they overdo things. They overinvest. A lot of times they talk about the inflation. They talk about the price level, but really the biggest problem with inflating the money supply and giving you artificially low interest rates is the malinvestment. People overinvest right. in investing in areas that they shouldn't be investing in, so you shouldn't guarantee that they're going to be bailed out. But it is conventional wisdom that one of the reasons why the recession in 2930 became a Great Depression was because of the gold standard. And there's research showing that those countries that got off the gold standard the quickest were the quickest to recover. Well, what you have to do is find out why we had a, a depression, and it was because we inflated in the 1920s. So the Fed, you know, this is interesting uh, because Bernanke is the expert, and he says the Fed was at fault because they didn't print enough money fast enough, right. and he always guaranteed he would, and he's, he's lived up to his word. He's gotten his helicopters out there, and he's dumping it out by the trillions of dollars. So I'll tell you, uh, you know, uh, the big problem was the Fed, but the Fed, according to free market economic and business cycle theory is that they inflated which causes the distortion and the recession is inevitable you should be talking about 1920 1921 they did the same thing they had to inflate once again uh, we had the fed we inflated for the war and we had to have the correction but nobody remembers 1921 1921 was well, one it? year one year severe depression but they did nothing and they just allowed interest rates to go up the collapse of uh, JDP uh, GDP went down and they were back on their feet again. The prolongation was we were propping up the system and not allowing the bad debt to be liquidated. We're doing the same thing again. We're into it five years. Japan did the same thing. And so we're going to be in this for a long, long time because, because we're not the allowing the liquidation of debt. Mm -hmm. And when the, you, you expect the Fed to come in and save them, they're not permitting the liquidation of debt. We buy the debt. We transfer the debt from those who had been making a lot of money in the derivatives, and we dump it on the taxpayer. Right. It's a very Congress, immoral what would system. The, what would the cost be? Where, where would unemployment be today if we didn't pursue the bailouts, if the Fed didn't inject the money that it did into the economy? What, what would, what's your expectation well, you, for either you know, unemployment, are, however you want to look at GDP in the, the economy right there, now? There are, yeah, there are <laughs> variables. What would you do with the tax code and what would you do with spending? I want to cut a trillion dollars of spending. You know, I want to get, I want the people to spend the right. money, not the government. So what you need to do is, what, what are you going to do with capital gains? What are you going to do with... Uh, no, I appreciate that, but I'm, I'm just saying if, if, you, if you took the bailouts off the table, for example, and, and you didn't, I mean... People would argue, you've argued that these is effectively steroids, what, what, right. what the Fed has put it. If you took that out of the system, what, where would we be right well, now? Well, the cost would obviously be a lot less. It wouldn't be trillions and trillions of dollars of obligation. It wouldn't be this shrinking of the middle class. And but would be, unemployment be 8% or would it be well, 16%? You don't, you don't know the numbers, but I'll bet it would be a lot better than it is now. We would have liquidated the debt. Housing, housing prices, instead of doing this and this and this for six years, what you would have was this, and it would be people would, oh, 
$100,000 house is now worth $10,000, now let's go buy it. People but, who saved, you know, could start buying their houses again. But the system, once you correct the monetary system, you might be rewarded for savings. And we, we get back to the market. The allocation of credit now is all done by the Fed. Even if you're it's right, not by the temporary saving. pain has to be enormous, though. You do recognize that. No, well, the, no the, the long term pain is 10 times worse than temporary pain. Sure, it could be a year. And like a I said, year, no, a year, I mean, in 19, 20, 21, it was one bad year, year and a half, maybe. But that's what it concerns me, too. They are, I, I understand the logic of thinking we have gotten on this system that has steroids. We have gotten carried away with things. The Fed allowed that entire housing bubble to build up, and so it has to come back down. What concerns me is when you start talking about a trillion dollars in cuts immediately rather than over the course of a decade or longer, when you start talking about getting rid of uh, or going back to the gold standard and getting rid of this uh, ability to print money and print your way out of things. I mean, I can't even imagine the unforeseen consequences. We talk about the unforeseen consequences that come with Dodd-Frank or something else along the way. I can't even imagine the unforeseen consequences that would come with that much of a, of a shock to the system where you're basically ripping off everything that's been created over the last five, six decades. Okay, if, if it's one year or so, that, that's different. But what your, your argument would say is let's do it over five or ten years. Let's have this, this you know, another worldwide depression is going to be very, very slow. And this is different than even the depression. This is much bigger and much worse. But there is a good example in the history of big cuts. World War II, we cut the budget by approximately 60 percent. Uh, taxes were cut 30 percent. And we had 10 million military personnel come back and they say, we have to have jobs programs, you know, because there was the a New Deal stuff. They didn't even have time to start the jobs program. But by that time, all the bad debt was liquidated. People came back. 10 million people were hired and we had an economic boom. The depression finally ended after World War II, about 46, 47. But tax rates went up significantly. I just looked at a lot of the IRS data for another column that I'd been working on and tax rate, taxes went up incredibly in terms of the collection. They brought all new people into the, I mean, the, I looked back at the tax rates. Because more people were working. But more, not only were more people working, but the rates went on people who were making a lot less money. People who had been making less money were suddenly, they were collecting taxes from all of them going up. There were things like the national victory tax. I looked at the tax rates and I couldn't figure out why they'd gone up so much until I after, called the IRS. After World War II? As, I, as World War II started, as they oh, got into Oh, it. yeah, sure. But afterwards, uh, a lot of that stuff was put aside, right. which helped my argument, you know, because they got rid of that and they allowed people to go back to work and pay and the revenues went up mainly because there were more, more people working. But it was still flawed because we still had the Fed to deal with and things came back. But uh, it was so much better uh, than it had been uh, after uh, we got out of the way. Germany's recovery was really when they right. decided no wage and price controls over there and rejected the American Keynesian advice to put on wage and price controls. And Europe recovered, and especially in Germany, uh, by just uh, not following our advice. Congressman, does the Walmart story relative to what's happening in Mexico and this allegation of bribery, does that fit into your economic framework or anything? What is your reaction well, to, to the, 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 the idea that, that Walmart is alleged to be have paid bribes in, in Mexico and is um, uh, alleged to have covered it up for many years? Well, I don't know the details of that, but if people are corrupt and paying bribes, I mean, that doesn't sound like a, uh, anything anybody can defend. So uh, why, why would you blame free markets or sign money? I'm like not that? blaming free markets. <laughs> I just wondered if you had a reaction to the, to the story. Oh, oh no. Uh, actually, I, I have a lot of respect. I don't know the details of that. I have a lot of respect for Walmart because it's a, a good business. The only time I get a little hesitant is when they use eminent domain, you mm -hmm. know, when they want some special properties and they right. take private property. I don't, I don't like that part of it, and I believe they've used that. Okay, more to come from our guest host, Ron Paul. Our guest host this morning is an open critic of the Fed, famously calling for an end to the institution. As we get ready for this week's two-day FOMC meeting, uh, we're joined by Dino Coase. He's a former executive vice president at the New York Fed and managing director at Hamilton uh, Appletonian Associates. And, of course, our guest host is uh, Ron Paul. Thank you for being here this morning. Good morning. Um, there's an article in today's New York Times, and I want you to react to it. I actually would love uh, Steve's view on this, too. Uh, it says, Bernanke has tried to speak more clearly and more frequently than his predecessors. He's lectured college students, met with members of the military. He holds his quarterly news conferences. Um, 
but there are now reasons to doubt that this effort of increasing public understanding is working. Uh, and he says that some say, uh, that the article says, some say the increased volume of communication is actually creating a cacophony uh, rather than clarity and uh, translating the Fed's actions and pronouncements for investors now is turning into a big consulting business for a lot of people. <laughs> uh, has this worked? Do you think you have any better understanding of where the Fed is headed than we did before? Well, look, you, you know, it's true. The Fed has, is speaking a lot more. The chairman is, is uh, speaking, uh, you know, six, whether it's 60 Minutes, whether it's college students, whether it's uh, press conferences. You know, we're hearing so much more from the Fed than we had in the past. You know, Steve will remember, until 1994, the Fed didn't even announce its policy actions. You know, you had to read it in their open market operations. So there is a lot more communications going on. You know, I think the, the, what, what people have to understand is that the Fed doesn't necessarily have, a, you know, nobody can tell what the future is going to be. And people always want to know, well, what will the Fed do in three months and six months? And the Fed doesn't know what it will do in three months or six months. And so it's that basic frustration thing that people so have. So is the communication helpful reflecting. then or, or hurtful ultimately? Well, uh, you know, I think what I would say is it, it can't hurt. Mm -hmm. It can't hurt, you know. It can't. I mean, it, it, it cannot. I, I, I think it cannot. Okay. And Ron Paul may disagree with you, well, but I don't know. We'll, we'll hear that. I'm sure, I'm sure he won't be shy about that. You know, and I think you know, the thing about Bernanke is that if you go back to his days as a professor at Princeton, he was always very big on clarity, on transparency, on communication. So he's living up to you know, the, the, um, the tenets that he had espoused before he was at the Fed. You believe there's no transparency to this system? Well, there's a little bit, but there's a lot of deception going on. You know, just recently, I think it was Dylan Radigan demanded some more paper, and on the Freedom of Information Act got a bunch, but uh, he tells me 60% or so was redacted, so the information you're really looking for. No, I, I don't really think so. I think where the, they're the most protective is probably on foreign transactions, and you know, there was a lot of foreign transactions going on in these currency swaps, and there's a lot of benefit, there's a lot of shenanigans going on there, and uh, we did it, you know, four or five Five years ago and we're preparing to do it again I'm, I'm, we're very much involved in currency swaps in order to uh, you know I see it as punishing the American people at the expense of, of helping other people banks that might own uh, the Greek debt and European debt and when you look at the large people well we got to protect the system but there's always somebody who has to pay and we see that this is too often you know whether the derivatives and the mortgages were bought out for the people who were going bankrupt the Fed Owns them, but indirectly, that's the people because it it further undermines the value of the currency, and, and this hurts people. So we, we see it only a transfer of wealth uh, where the rich get bailed out and the poor. And middle class is getting smaller and they get a poor and getting poorer. They lost their jobs and they lost their houses. So that that is our concern that it it serves the interest of those who get the money first. And if they get into trouble, they get the bailouts. And a lot of people agree with that. I think, you know, on the question of you know, there's a lot of controversy, obviously, about bailouts and who should get the bailouts and who shouldn't. Now, you know, Congress has actually acted to constrict what the Fed can do, how, what kind of lending it can do with Dodd Frank. Uh, you know. The, the kinds of loans that the right. Fed made to, let's say, AIG, it cannot do. It can only. Uh, uh, so that's the Treasury. So right, right, right. Well, that it tr and that's only for broad programs right. that are open to everybody. So you know, Congress can take steps to limit what the Fed can do, and in fact, it has done that. You know, the the, the, the Fed uh, has to live uh, within the democratic process, right? And uh, it can do what the Federal Reserve Act allows it to do, and Congress can act to restrict that. Well, again, which it did do. But they came do. up with all kinds of new tools that nobody had. Really really thought of before. It, it's not just the idea of, of tinkering with interest rates. Beyond that, there was quantitative easing and different types of policies, even this Operation Twist, that probably nobody was thinking about when they came up with the, the, the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, you know, the, the, the Federal Reserve Act gives the Fed broad objectives. And then the Fed has to, you know, has instruments within those uh, with, with, to, to achieve those objectives. Now, the, 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 the Congress can always act to change the objectives. They have not done that it's since mm -hmm. 1978, right? In fact, there's, it's not a dual mandate. It's actually three mandates. It's maximum employment, uh, it's price stability, and it's modest long-term interest rates, which people usually forget about. So you've got these broad objectives, and then you've got instruments that the Fed has, uh, reserve requirements, uh, uh, purchasing assets, uh, setting interest rates, et cetera, right? And then the, Fed, the Congress can act to restrict that if it thinks that the Fed's misusing those. Uh, right. it, you know, it, basically, that has not happened. Did, did you know, but, I, I, but so often, they can get around that. Say 
they don't want or are not allowed to give a direct loan to a, a bank in Europe. But if they do a currency swap and then the central bank goes and does it, it's indirectly, it gets mixed up. That's why the audit is so important because they can hide these things. Uh, it, it, isn't, it might not be direct and technically they may be following the recommendation or the law of the Congress, but believe right. me, there's plenty of room to get around or otherwise we would know all these things. Uh, and why do you think Ben Bernanke is doing things that benefit banks and hurt the middle class? Does he like banks more you know, than the middle class? I, I've asked both Greenspan and Greenspan and Bernanke this question, and, and it wasn't uh, you know it wasn't a sharp conversation at all. And it has to do with why do you keep interest rates so low? Uh, and hurt the people who want to save, the people who are frugal, the people who have a CD. Maybe the interest rates, see, I believe in market interest rates. I don't believe in this managed economy by manipulation of interest rates. So if somebody's retired, they save their money, and they have a $100,000 CD, and they make 1%, and the market says they should make six. I ask them, why do you penalize them? And they said, they admit that is true. They said, that's what you have to do because you're saving the system. You have to preserve, you know, financial stability. And I care about the fairness to the people who right. might save because I want the market to work. I want allocation of credit by savings, not by somebody creating money out of thin air and uh, giving it to their friends in a secret Dino, manner. We've got to leave it there, Dino. We're going to have to have you back. <laughs> we'll have be both back to continue this uh, dialogue. Appreciate you both being this here. This is the substance of the debate yep. right there. Right there. Right there. Uh, Co Congressman uh, Paul, the, the Fed meets this week. Uh, it will. Uh, it has Operation Twist, which is ending in June. The market not expecting additional quantitative easing from the Federal Reserve. In your opinion, should the Fed just let these programs end, or would you even counsel rolling them back? Well, the market will eventually roll them back in real terms, but no, they should be ended. Uh, why continue the process that hasn't achieved a whole lot? I mean, here we are, we're still in a slump. Actually, I think our economy has been slumping since the uh, collapse of the NASDAQ bubble. You know, real job growth isn't there, real wealth isn't been growing. So I think we're, we're continuing that. So this whole idea that you can solve your problem of too much spending and debt and inflating the money supply with more debt and more, in, in, uh, more spending and more uh, in, inflation of the money supply is preposterous. So I don't see any way that this will solve it so that the sooner they get out of it, the better. And uh, the, 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 there is a real question on how you do it. I would like, see, I don't call, although I stand for getting rid of the Fed, I don't call for the end of the Fed tomorrow. Matter of fact, if you read that carefully, what I want is just competition. You know, I want people to opt out of the system they can. Today, if you want to use another currency, internationally you use different currencies all the time. Why can't we use it domestically? Uh, but there's laws against it, you go to jail. If you try to use a silver dollar as, as currency, and that's, uh, that is the law of the land. So all I want is competition, and I think the uh, people who love paper money and the Fed and buying those bonds and to make no interest, let them buy the bonds. And, and they're outpriced. But I would say that we should be talking about buying gold bonds once again. Okay. That's, that's, what we, you that's the direction you, we need to move. Do you personally own anything but gold? Do you, you own stocks in the market? Do you, what do you do well, with your money? Well, uh, mining stocks, and uh, I, I, like, uh, I like gold, but I, I, like, uh, I like real estate. You know, real, real real estate, but long term, no debt, maybe some income from it. Uh, that, that's, that's more like something of real value. I think you uh, don't like treasuries. Pardon me? You don't like treasuries? Oh, oh boy. <laughs> I guess that's where you go. I mean, look, look at these trillions of dollars that go into treasuries. And of course, but who buys a 30 year bond as an investment? Oh, yeah, I want to take care of my kids. I'm going to put it in a bond and it's, I'm going to have that money. These, the world is buying these bonds. In fact, it sounds to me like the world has more confidence in the U.S. and its financial position well, than you do. They're awash in dollars because we've created so many in the other but currencies. But they're buying them. They're making an individual they don't have any market choice. Else. Do you want them to, to buy, buy them. euros? But why are they buying the United States? <laughs> There's nothing else to buy. Because relatively, and the world is a relative place, yeah. right? It's not an objective there, place. There is still, they're buying the United States. I would concede there's still an illusion and a trust in the U.S. dollar. It's still a reserve currency. But what happens if they start pricing oil in something than other dollars? And, and people, what are they going to price that in? Well, they might. somebody might come up with another currency. The other Currents, other countries are now getting together. Four or five and countries. Are, yeah, they're they're talking about using something else. And uh, what what if somebody comes up with the gold back currency? And somebody says, Hey, this is a better idea. Uh, once you get more rampant price inflation, people may opt. 
No, I think the dollar is destined to lose its reserve status, and this will change and the what, whole over world. what period of time? Yeah, when's it happen? Well, it, that's one thing you can't predict. But I'll bet you uh, that uh, I, I don't. It could happen any time because the foundation is gone for the whole system. Could be five years, could be ten years, but it'll eventually be replaced. All right. Rick, thank you for joining us this morning, and uh, we have uh, more from our guest host coming up, Becky. That's right. When we come back, we're going to be talking more with Ron Paul about uh, some issues that we haven't gotten to yet today. Uh, making headlines this morning, AAA says that gasoline prices are below uh, year-ago levels for the first time since October 2009. The average price now falling almost five cents in the latest week to $3.85. Eight cents. Uh, There's a lot of people going back and forth. We've been tweeting about this this morning. 385, I think that's AAA. Right. The national average, according to Lumber Survey, that. is 391. People saying, "Hey, do you have your well, facts?" You go out right? to it California, on, it's six bucks. Which, yeah, and in Chicago, it's well above four dollars. But it depends on where you are and which survey you're looking at. It uh, 385 is AAA, and 391 is the Lumberg Survey. They do both show a drop of about. Ron Paul, you so. see gas prices all over the place. What, what's, what's the highest price you've seen on your 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 world your your national tour. Well, when campaign. I leave Texas, all of a sudden I'm impressed because I see number four frequently. <laughs> right. And I've been very impressed by that. But, uh, you know, I guess things don't go straight up or straight down. My guess is that uh, long term they're going to continue to go up. I remember the 70s so clearly. Uh, you, you know, a, a barrel of oil was $5. It went up as high as 40, you know, over a 10 year period. It went down, uh, back down to 10. Yeah. And there's all kinds of reasons, embargoes and, and the various reasons they give you drilling, uh, why prices go up, supply and demand. But what they don't talk about is inevitably the, the value of the dollar. So if you look at the value of oil and the value of the currency, it does a lot of this, but long term, it reflects the basic value of the dollar. And the value of the dollar is going down, so the price of oil and gasoline, long term, will continue to go up. And if you have a crisis, if we continue to mess up in the Middle East and mess around with Iran and we, that breaks out, you could, you could see $200 barrel of gasoline and you're gonna see a real, real chaos in this country. That's the potential. We we have had sitting Fed officials, including Bullard from St. Louis, the Fed president in St. Louis, mm -hmm. who have said that they do believe that all of the easy money policies have had some impact on the commodities market. He talked about oil in particular. Right. Um, but I don't think you'd see them say that we shouldn't do the steps that we've taken as a result. It's something I think they believe we need to watch, but they still think that monetary policy and having the Fed riding over that is an important yeah. thing. Well, I can understand it, and you even made the point there about the pain that might go through if you do this. I look at it in medical terms. It's sort of like an addiction. You know, getting off a drug isn't easy, but if you don't get off the drug, you kill the patient. And our economy does depend on government stimulus and spending and inflation and bailing out and honoring you know this moral hazard that we will bail you out because if you remove it there is there is some suffering from that but long term it isn't good and uh, we, we are addicted to this system it's not going to be easy I don't think it's nothing can be solved until we as a people reassess what the role of government ought to be. If, you, if everybody thinks we should be the policemen of the world and have this entitlement system from cradle to grave, run our personal lives and have this monstrous government violating our civil liberties, I'll tell you what, no, this is, this is going to continue. So we have to once again reassert ourselves and decide what type of government do we want? Do we want to have this right? micromanager? But another part you, of your platform is that you think the U.S. should pull back quite substantially on foreign aid. Oh, no, not just foreign aid, especially the military and everything. I mean, our national debt went up $4 trillion due to the spending overseas in the last 10 years, fighting wars that were undeclared, unwinnable. We don't know why we're there. We're, there's so much chaos. The violence is getting worse in Iraq. They're talking about Kurdistan breaking away. Uh, they they want to go in. We're into Syria already. They're anxious to go to into Iran. All this nation building going on. Uh, no, I want to get out of there. There's no benefit whatsoever. And it's a consistent part of libertarian philosophy that these foreign entanglements create the nexus for the ceding of freedoms back home. You, you mean... In other words, if, if we're going to have all these expenses 
overseas, then we have to cede certain financial freedoms at home to pay for it. Oh, all, all the time. And look at look at what has happened to our, our civil liberties. It's an economic consequence. There's a civil liberty a component to, to it. Oh, yes. And uh, it doesn't help our national defense. The interesting thing is... In the, it doesn't in the current, help our national defense? With, one, one second. The interesting thing is in this current campaign, I get more money than all the other candidates, even way back for the last year, than all the other candidates put together. So my foreign policy is what is attracted to the military. You, you said it doesn't help our national defense to be in all these places. Why not? Because uh, of the blowback phenomenon, you know, we go over. How can it help us building more and more enemies? How can it help us by saying we're occupying your country? And I like to tell people, look at it this way. What if anybody did to us what we do to other countries? And we march in, we put our troops in, we kill a lot of people. We now have declared war on the world with a global war on terrorism and every spot on the but earth is vulnerable to our to, drone attack. But that's, that's, it happened as a result of 2011. That is an excuse and it's a misunderstanding. The war in Iraq was planned. The first speech I gave against the war in Iraq was in 1998 because the policy was changed and I said our policy now is to remove Saddam Hussein. He used to be our friend but now we're going to get rid of him. No, that was an excuse. It's, Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with 9-11 and Saudi Arabia, which is our best friend, runs a Sharia law, 15 out of the 19, we don't say a word about them. No question that we were attacked on our soil, though. I mean, sure. No question that we were attacked, maybe, and how maybe, do you respond? Maybe if you understand Al-Qaeda, yes, they purposely did it, and they, and, and they explained exactly why. And they said it was because we had, uh, had, we had troops in Saudi Arabia on their holy land and we had this embargo and bombing mission for 10 years in Iraq that our people uh, admitted killed 500,000 children. That's what, the, that's what the Muslims know about. So they, they, they felt very justified to get our attention. But to, to say... Well, what would you say about what Saddam Hussein did to, did to, did to his own people? For example, well, what did the Soviets do to their own people, and what did uh, the Chinese do, and what did Pol Pot do? Uh, how much did we tolerate there, and what's a, how much suffering is going on in Africa? Big jump from that to whether or not that's a, a reason for a U.S. Uh, no, look, I, you, you know where I stand on, on the larger I picture. I'm probably closer to him, but there are there are issues. I agree that that you could fight back on. So. He sure makes you think that Congressman Paul. He does. And we're going to have a little bit more of him coming. We're back. Our guest host this morning has been Ron Paul. And uh, before you go, I got two questions for you. One right. actually came in from a viewer who asks, should workers at every level be able to save their wage in currency, in the U.S. currency, meaning not invest in the market, and still be able to, quote unquote, store their purchasing power? <laughs> You get the question? Well, yeah, but they can't do it if you do it in Federal Reserve notes. There's no storage of Correct, wealth. But, but, but in the broad context, in, your, in a perfect world, if you got rid of the Fed, yeah. would you still be able to do that? Oh, absolutely. More so. The, the Fed is a counterfeiter. He counterfeits and destroys the value of money. But if you have real money, you encourage savings, and you, uh, you can accumulate wealth. And this is where real capital comes from. Capital cannot come out of a printing press or out of a computer. Capital has to come what is left over after you earn something, and you use what you need and what you save. That's the only true measurement of capital. The only reason that the Federal Reserve, what they do, acts as capital because it dilutes the real right. value of your money, and that causes Quick. the gross distortions and hurts so many people. Quick political question. If you do not get the nomination to be Republican president, will you back and support Mitt Romney? I haven't thought that through and I haven't made a decision. And uh, it depends a lot on uh, whether he agrees with me on my foreign policy and uh, on the Fed. And if not, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't support him? I would think about it. I get along real well with him, but better than, than the rest. But we don't have much in common on, on politics. I mean, he, he's not very Did you end up supporting Bush? Pardon me? Did you end up supporting Bush? Um, you ran I don't previous? know whether uh, I did not support McCain. Okay. I didn't make an announcement on the others. But okay. I, uh, I wasn't very happy. With um, real quick before you go, there is a video game in the works. The yes. Ron Paul video game. You know about this? I've heard about it, but you know all about the law and finance and all. If they do that, do, do I get a cut on that stuff? <laughs> I think you That's should. What you're trying to do. You, if you play the video game, you can try and destroy the Fed along but the way. But they, who knows? If it's a friend, I'm obviously it must be a friend. Maybe he's doing this. He'll probably send money to, <laughs> to the campaign. <laughs> well, you can only you can only hope. Uh, it has been great to have you here. Thank you very uh, much. Appreciate it very very much, Ron Paul. Okay. Um, good luck with the campaign.